right, I think our attendees are joining are starting to slow. So we can go ahead and get started because I don't want to waste any of the time that we have with, with these three amazing panelists. Um, so first off, thank you so much to everybody who's joining us today. Thank you so much to our three amazing panelists. Uh, welcome everybody to our panel on promising blockchain ventures and institutional investment. We're really fortunate today to have uh, three great panelists with us. We have Alok Basudev, Jan Robinson, and Jeff Amico. I'll let them mostly introduce themselves, but I'll give you uh, all a really brief introduction to all of them. Uh, Jeff is a partner on the crypto team at A16Z. Before joining A16Z, he was the general counsel at Fluidity. Uh, and before Fluidity, he practiced law at Cravath, Wayne & Moore in New York. Dan is a research partner at Paradigm who focuses on crypto investments and research into open source protocols. Previously, Dan was a protocol researcher at Interstellar. And before that, Dan also practiced as an attorney at Paul Weiss. Uh, and he is a graduate both of HLS and of Harvard University. Uh, and third, we have Alok Vasudev, who is the co-founder of Standard Crypto. Alok has worked with startups in crypto, genomics, and AI. He's been a VC at Spectrum 28 and Benchmark. And before that, he was an engineer and scientist in semiconductors and nanophotonics. So we have a really exciting panel today. Um, and so to start us off, I guess I'll ask all of you, can you tell us a little bit more about your background in crypto? How did you ultimately decide to get into the VC world? Dan, you're green on my screen. Do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, yeah, so I uh, became interested in crypto while I was, uh, while I was practicing law um, and was thinking about, thinking about leaving law as many, as many lawyers do. And I uh, ultimately left to become an engineer and landed at a company called Chain. And that was during sort of the permissioned blockchain um, cycle. And we can talk a little more about the, the crypto um, investment cycles that there have been. Um, but worked there as a protocol researcher for a few years and ended up uh, joining Paradigm two years ago to sort of help out with a lot of, uh, with the portfolio companies and help out the investment team trying to understand things in the space. Great, thanks. Uh, Alok, you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so I, uh, I started my investment career as a generalist VC um, as, at Benchmark, as you mentioned, and uh, I, got my sea legs or cut my teeth as an investor working with companies that tended to do with network effects, things like social networks or things like marketplaces, and also um, things that had to do with, with hardcore computing infrastructure, um, open source projects and developer tools. Um, and, and having some type of an understanding of both of those um, really prepared me to, to understand Bitcoin properly, at least grok it. Um, when I first saw it, it's a combination of an open source project with a user network overlaid on top in a really deep and profound way. Um, and, and you can't, when you understand it, I think it's hard to unsee the world um, with something like that not playing a major role. And so then it became a career and ultimately a, a firm. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. So I, like Dan, was a corporate lawyer in a former life. Um, mostly handling kind of IPOs, bond offerings, credit facilities, kind of very, very traditional Wall Street uh, capital markets practice. Um, saw what was happening in, in this industry back in the last boom around 2017. And not only did I find it to be just far more interesting than my day job, but also believed that it really did have the potential to transform uh, a lot of what I was doing in that kind of regular kind of capital markets um, workflow. So uh, made the jump to a startup in the space called AirSwap, uh, which is a decentralized exchange. As our general counsel, was there for a little over a year and then joined uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, about a year and a half ago now. Great. Um, and before I get into our next question, I was like too excited to start this panel and I forgot to tell everybody what format we're using. Um, so we'll do about 30 to 35 minutes of moderated uh, Q&A with, with me asking the questions and uh, folks who are listening, if you wanna drop any questions that you have as we go along into the Q&A, we'll, we'll save the last 15 minutes or so for, for Q&A from the audience. Um, so feel free to add in your questions as we go along or you can drop them in at the end um, and we'll, we'll bring those up at the end. Um, so getting into things a little bit more, um, crypto's changed a lot in the last few years. So what in your view are some of the most promising trends in crypto right now? Um, how have these changed sort of since you've been involved in the industry and kind of in particular in the last few years as crypto has gotten um, a little bit more a little bit more mainstream, a little bit more in the public eye. Um, and I'll let you guys decide who goes first on this one. 
I'll, I'll jump in. So maybe I'll just offer a, a kind of high level um, view. And I'm sure we'll, we'll go into specific verticals after this, but I think, and Dan actually kind of alluded to this up front, but what I'm excited about is that we are starting to see real adoption and an embrace of the, the strong form of the technology, of the kind of pure form of the technology, which, which is to say public blockchains, tokens, cryptocurrencies, and we're kind of shifting a little bit away from the enterprise blockchain, private blockchain era of the technology. And so, you know, you're seeing this with companies adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets, with institutions offering custody of cryptocurrencies, with users starting to actually use applications that are built on things like Ethereum and other public blockchains. So for me, at just a very high level, it's, it's heartening to see the kind of real version of the technology being used and adopted. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. And I think there is also some more clarity on what kinds of use cases make sense. I think in the in 2017 and, and 2017 was probably the height of this because uh, blockchains were capable of much more, but people hadn't really figured out what they're not capable of. So in like 2013, it was very Bitcoin driven and some other uh, uh, layer ones. But um, in 2017, we saw people sort of saying like, oh, let's, let's, let's decentralize everything and put it on the blockchain. Well, I think like there's, Quite, quite possibly we're going to get there for a lot of different applications. What blockchains make the most sense for um, right now, uh, or at least I've thought so, is applications where you have ownership of some, of some asset, where it's, where it's a decentralized ledger. Um, and so we've seen that with DeFi becoming a larger thing, decentralized finance, um, which is sort of an extension of what uh, cryptocurrencies done, uh, like Bitcoin has done for money. And then we um, have seen this with NFTs, which are ownership of, uh, of other things. We can talk about, I think we're going to talk a little more about that. But these are these are applications for which the tech, tech the initial Bitcoin um, style blockchain actually sort of makes a lot more sense because you know it ultimately is sort of a ledger for this single token and so extending it to these other things and then allowing programmability of those makes sense on this on this kind of layer. Yeah, I think I think really well said by both Jeff and Dan. Um, if, if to to put it in a word um, or kind of a small number of words, I think Ethereum and the application ecosystem on top of Ethereum. Um, is probably the biggest shift in terms of validation and scale there. Um, earlier, I think we were, there was a lot of focus on base layer blockchains, on, on consensus systems. Um, but now I think there's, there's been um, uh, a lot of momentum accruing to platforms like Ethereum, and we're starting to move innovation up the stack and, and use it for things, which is really exciting. And And what do you think is driving this shift sort of Back to back to the pure technology, kind of back to Bitcoin, Ethereum tokens. I'll jump in. I think to Alok's point, I think that the infrastructure is, is better in a better place than it was in 2017, and so the, the apps are actually usable now. Um, you know, just let's just take NFTs for, for example. Um, you know, in in the last era of of the kind of crypto kind of evolution, you had Crypto Kitties, which basically um, like crushed the Ethereum blockchain. And so kind of, you know, not only on Ethereum with, with scaling solutions that have emerged, but also the introduction of other blockchains like Flow, um, you're, you're starting to see these things actually be able to be used by consumers. Um, and so maybe I'll, maybe I'll pause there, but I think at least at an infrastructure layer, we're, we're just farther along than we were back in 2017. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think, um... To, to Jeff's point and Dan's point in the in the earlier question, I think there's just been an understanding of of the right things to use these types of technologies and applications for. Um, I think the infrastructure needs to get sufficiently good for applications to start to make sense on top. Um, once that's the case, um, and applications start attracting users and usage, um, it creates an incentive for the infrastructure to get even better. Um, but I would say part of it is just time and, and an understanding of, of what are the right things we should be used for. Um, finance, uh, as a great example, it's the next logical step after you have digital monetary assets is now writing programs to deal with the money, which is another word for finance. Um, and so it's, it's just following the progression. I think a lot of us saw, um, but, but it's just taking its due course. I, sh I should also note that it's not just about tech not being ready for applying that for decentralizing other things is that in, before Bitcoin, it was possible to decentralize quite a lot. And in fact, we saw a lot of decentralization, basically the web um, already much more decentralized than perhaps it could have been. And we saw the advantages of that. And 
um, you know, individual computing being, being decentralized, the ability to program your own computer. These are all sort of decentralization revolutions, personal computing, the internet. Um, and we don't necessarily think about them as, as, decent, as decentralization. And then money was one of these difficult problems that didn't seem like it, like it could be decentralized possibly um, until, until uh, money and, and ownership of assets. And I think we, we saw like 10 years ago that this, this started to change. And so that's why we're seeing this revolution in these particular applications, whereas others, it's not yet clear why, why decentralization might be better um, or why, why blockchain would enable more decentralization than has already happened helpfully for, for many of them. Uh, the, my lawyer brain is also reminding me that uh, I should disclose um, that, uh, well, uh, I, do, I do work for Paradigm. I'm here on my own behalf speaking and not representing the opinions of the, um, of the founder of, an, of my employer. And I'm sure that is true for Alok and Jeff as well. I'll co so Alok runs his firm, so I don't, know, I don't know if that's true, but. <laughs> <laughs> Same <Samesies>. Z's. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> All right, great. So, so I think this kind of segues nicely into talking about uh, DeFi. We have a whole panel on that later, but um, sort of at a high level, what are some of the most interesting trends that you're seeing in the DeFi space in particular? And sort of as, a, as the kind of flip side to that, where are some of the places where you think DeFi is like not quite going to take off in the way that people might be looking at it right now? I, I can jump, but I think at a very high level, I think DeFi is taking off because it's allowing people to engage in transactions and other types of activity that they just didn't have the ability to before. So, you know, you could think about something like, um, like market making, for example. Um, historically, to be a market maker, you had to have an enormous balance sheet. You had to um, basically be one of, of kind of 10 or so banks were located on Wall Street. Uh, you had to have the overhead and all the other infrastructure in place to do it. And now comes along an app, an app like Uniswap, which basically abstracts away all of that complexity, which allows people to just pool their funds on a global basis through a very simple interface and allows anyone to engage in that activity to make money. There are, there are probably nine or 10 other functions or kind of applications or transactions throughout DeFi that do the same thing. So at a very high level, that's, that's the brilliance of it. Now, obviously, that, that kind of butts up against regulation in some interesting ways that we can talk about. But I think that, that kind of basic intuition is why it's really taken off. In my view, what we're seeing in this, in this current boom, which I think uh, at least many, many would characterize as largely a DeFi-driven um, uh, boom in interest in, in crypto, is a lot about creativity and creating applications rather than maybe like the, the, the usage of, uh, of those applications. So to me, at least, what excites me a lot about DeFi is just the ability to sort of express these kinds of these new ideas to try to innovate on, on market making strategies and um, on, on designs for synthetic assets um, in a way that you just can't really unless maybe you're one of like 100 people who work at a, at a big bank. I don't know. I was a lawyer, but I wasn't the right kind of lawyer. So I, wouldn't, I wasn't in a situation where I could innovate on, on um, these things. And we're seeing just a lot of people do it. Uh, including people who have, who have very little financial experience, but just might have one uh, interesting idea. And so the, the boom is largely in just like we see many, many applications. And then, of course, uh, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of usage right now, um, and that's, and that's uh, part of it. But um, I think we're starting to see just like a, this Cambrian explosion of, of iteration on, on, on new ideas, and that's what's most exciting to me about it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, finance has never been a frontier before. Um, it's been something that's been heavily tethered to incumbents and legacy systems, um, whereas things like the internet uh, have really provided a frontier where people can permissionlessly innovate, can experiment at the speed of software, um, and even fintech today as we know it, I think about it, it's lipstick on a pig, um, right, and, and it's, it's cosmetic and, and user interface improvements on top of a system that probably still uses COBOL and faxes somewhere behind the scenes. Um, and here we have a full stack um, software opportunity in finance. Um, speed of software is how we can move. Uh, the pace of experimentation is on par with the internet. Um, and what's also really special is that the ownership models for these um, applications and products and services is, is different as well. Um, crypto is about dis disintermediating middlemen um, and, and replacing um, systems that sat in between users and counterparties um, and relying on software and, and base level blockchain infrastructure to replace that. Um, so users are owning these networks and have voice in, in these financial applications like they never had before. Um, and these things are efficient. 
um, capital efficient and, and, and just uh, efficient generally um, in ways they've never been before. So building on that a little bit, um, I'd like to ask a little bit about governance um, and what are you looking for in terms, what, what do you consider to be good governance and kind of what sorts of things are you looking for when you're looking at companies? And again, where are you seeing some things that might be misfiring? That's a good question. Um, if, if we're talking about DeFi in particular, you know, the, the idea of, of DeFi, and this, this pertains to a lot of crypto also, but in, in DeFi often things will start as looking like a traditional company and then they will look to decentralize their operations over time. And so they can get to the point basically where the protocol has transcended the original company and kind of lives on its own as an open financial application that anyone can use and access. And so, um, you know, I, I think there are, there are examples of, of companies who are doing a great job of this and are kind of going through that transition very well. It, it's very difficult though, right? Because this is a very new concept that someone could create an application or company, if you want to think about it like that, and then just kind of hand the reins off to a, a global community of users and other stakeholders. Um, and, and again, I want to reemphasize that, you know, the core value innovation here, I think, is that you're building an application that will remain open, accessible, the rules won't change under people's feet. And you, you need to make sure that you're not losing that core property as you kind of build in governance. And so it, it can be very difficult to find what the right amount of community governance is, and, and as opposed to, um, you know, kind of building something that can just kind of live and kind of stay stable versus building something that is kind of evolutionary over time, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And, and I think that there's, um, it's a really nuanced topic. And I think what we're learning are that there are some places where you want a really dynamic system of governance where you can rapidly adapt things and, and you want heavy community involvement and, and kind of steerage. And then there are other things that you want to look more like Unix programs or libraries that kind of stay the same forever um, and you can count on them um, not changing. Um, and so I, I think right now we we're, it's still, in the earliest phases of understanding how token holders should play a role um, and, and what they should be able to change and how um, and, and how community ownership of, of these these kind of public goods operates. Um, but but it's not one size fits all. And, and I think if this is an area that you're interested in, um, there's there's never been a better time to kind of jump in and think through some of these problems. Yeah, so I think I'll take maybe the extreme other end of the of the spectrum in that I think governance in these protocols while often necessary is, is generally a bug. Um, it's something where there's, there's a problem that can't be solved otherwise, or in, when, when a protocol is well-designed, there's a problem that can't be solved otherwise. So we have to have some escape valve here for, um, for uh, human guided or, or community guided decision-making. But uh, to the extent possible, if a, if a protocol can be run in a, in a, in a governance minimized way, and my colleague Fred um, uh, Ursum and I wrote a, wrote a post about this called governance minimization, um, I think I think that's that's sort of the ideal state, and Bitcoin is an example of a of a governance minimized protocol um, where there have been you know uh, some bitter community fights over the fact that it's very hard to upgrade Bitcoin, and I've been frustrated by how hard it is to upgrade Bitcoin, but that's now generally considered to be a feature of it. Um, I think uh, Uniswap's another example. I should disclose where uh, the paradigms uh, an investor in Uniswap, um, but Uniswap when it started out had had no governance at all. And it wasn't until it wasn't until later iterations of the protocol that introduced more um, uh, essentially a need a need to uh, have certain aspects governed by by uh, by the community um, that, that can't just be automatically done by a smart contract um, that those were introduced. But I think those are those are often a vulnerability. So building on that theme a little bit um, and kind of coming back to the idea that this is right now we're talking about like finance as a frontier. Uh, corporate governance generally is an area that is getting a lot of attention right now. There's a lot of discussions about how corporate governance is in a little bit of crisis. I'm a joint degree at HLS and HBS, and I, I'm seeing these conversations sort of at both schools. So I'm wondering, uh, given the sort of cultural force of blockchain and of cryptos in particular, do you see any of these governance models sort of making their way out of the crypto sphere and sort of into the broader mainstream, even outside of the DeFi space? 
I think what, you know, this is, this is perhaps not a, an overly deep or conceptual observation, but at least at a more superficial level, you know, some of the innovations of on-chain governance that we've seen with applications like Uniswap, like Compound, um, I think you could very easily see them being ported over. Um, you know, just the, the amount of transparency that it, it introduces into these systems is, is totally foreign to the traditional corporate governance model, which relies on a once a year proxy system where people literally mail out uh, a, a list of ballots and then we kind of get the, the results back a month later. Um, by contrast in, in crypto, or at least in DeFi, you, know, you have votes that come up frequently. You see how everyone voted or didn't vote. You immediately get to implement the change on chain. Um, so I, I think it's very easy to see that type of thing having an appeal. And, and then this is a somewhat related topic, but the idea, you know, and as a former corporate lawyer, you know, I used to spend an enormous amount of time um, writing companies 10Ks, their 10Qs, and updating the financial statements and all of those things. You now have the ability with uh, these protocols that live on chain to automatically trace all of their cash flows, all of their revenues instantly, just by looking at this, this transparent ledger. So introducing that kind of transparency and automation into the corporate governance system, into the accounting system, I think, is is ultimately going to be the future of this stuff. Yeah, I think, I think there's well said, Jeff. I think that there is um, there's a general trend um, even outside of crypto um, of just recognizing the importance um, that users or a community can have um, in really helping establish a mode or entrench um, a business. And so I think there is a big trend of how can, uh, how can companies um, do better by the users and community that add value to their products and services. Um, and I think that when you look over in crypto, it's the extreme form of that, um, right? And so it's, it's not to say that, that you know, you're gonna get um, the compound governance module is, is gonna manage shareholder votes anytime soon. Um, but, uh, but I think these ideas will find a way to play out. And I think that um, something that I'm, I'm interested in um, is understanding how you can have a company and a token holding community that sit side by side um, where one is not entirely subordinate to the other. Uh, there's some sort of structural checks and balances between the two. Uh, I think it's, that's a model that you're gonna see a couple um, experiments around um, this year. Um, and, and that'll be really interesting for, for us to see. I also think we're at a phase right now where uh, crypto governance is learning a lot from uh, traditional structures of corporate governance. Um, so the importance of some of these of some of these sort of uh, layers of indirection um, between just sort of raw shareholder voting and and direct executive action. Um, I think people are sort of relearning some of those lessons as they have relearned other lessons in finance um, over time. I think then and yeah, so I think I think there's a lot there's a lot for crypto governance when it's needed to to kind of learn from that and to iterate on it. I also think in sort of the far future, um, crypto crypto I think is going to start innovating on kinds of governance that are more maybe weirder than just uh, ones that are that ultimately boil down to, to sort of shareholder voting. And so like quadratic voting is one example. And this is one that's been that's been pioneered by uh, Vitalik Buterin, among others, um, the, the, the co-founder of Ethereum. Um, there's prediction markets where you could have a, a company or an organization that's governed basically by, by markets betting on what on what decisions will be best for the, for the uh, project. And I think, you know, these these uh, have been tried in uh, the traditional world, but there's a lot of more friction there. And maybe less need to have these really ironclad, um, solid game theoretically optimal games for for corporate governance when you already have these other structures. And when you take away that safety net, when you take away a lot of the you know the ability of um, of the law to act as a backstop, for example, people really you know have to then uh, try to solve these problems from scratch. And that could lead to different things. The same way that it led to uh, the development of the constraints of Ethereum led to the development of new DeFi primitives like Uniswap. I think we'll start to see these constraints lead to new governance primitives as well. So I think we could stay on this topic for quite a while, but just in the interest of time, I want to switch over a little bit to talking about uh, non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Um, and in particular, I think some of the, I mean, we're seeing a lot of really innovative uses for NFTs, but I think one area where we're seeing a lot of innovation is in the gaming context. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how you see NFTs in the gaming context, and if there are any trends there that you think are really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 take, a, I'll take a stab. Um, uh, I, I think that the, there was a lot of uh, 
when, when people looked at, at the use cases for crypto early on, um, I think people taught it was about the ownership of digital goods. Um, and I think one area where the ownership of digital goods has already been pioneered is in, in gaming, um, where you can own an in-game item um, or you could, you could own something that you use in the game. Um, and I, I think what was exciting about the intersection of crypto with that is whether there could exist secondary markets for those items. You could own them um, in the true sense. Um, you could take it with you potentially from game to game. Um, and, and just the idea to, to add a much more fully functioning market and ownership model um, to those type of in-game assets. Um, that, that's kind of one flavor that I think we've seen um, a number of companies working towards. Um, I think the other are, are kind of games where the game is really dealing with um, um, kind of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, for example. Um, you can have Hearthstone-like games where each card is an asset that's owned and has specific properties and rarity, and, and you can buy it on an open market, but then you can use it in the game itself. Um, so I would say that it, it's an area that still, um, I think a lot of us are excited about. Um, I, I would say it, it, it is a use case, unlike DeFi, where um, DeFi was just more ready for, for kind of more mainstream adoption because of the technology needed, because of the user behavior changes needed. Um, it's something that's still a little bit more forward looking, uh, but I think it's something that a lot of really terrific entrepreneurs are working on right now. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, um, you know, I think the, the core innovation of it, like, like Bitcoin, like a lot of these other things, is introducing the idea of, of scarcity into the digital world. And, you know, in, in the same way that in the physical world, we can very tangibly prove that we own our car or our house and then we can sell them on to others, we can consume them, whatever it might be. We finally now created the, the technology necessary to port that over into the digital world too. And so um, whether it's kind of taking your you know, skin or your shield from one game to another game or selling it into a secondary market, um, or, you know, and that's also just in kind of the gaming vertical, but you can also see this happening and really taking off in the digital art world as well. Uh, but I think it's the same concept kind of, um, that's kind of repeating itself throughout. It's the idea that you can truly own something for the first time in the digital in the digital world is pretty profound. And how, if at all, do you think COVID has accelerated some of these trends? And what do you think are going to be some of the most durable effects? COVID has had, I think, an interesting effect on the on the crypto community in that. On the one hand, it was already very remote, um, and so a lot of the work has sort of has uh, gone on and, and maybe even been accelerated. Um, although it certainly, I think, has has uh, hurt um, in some ways the, the community and, and just their ability to, to come together at, at conferences, which is sort of the tradition. So I think, as far as its effect on the on the industry, you know, I think crypto has been lucky uh, to have been spared some of the of the most um, uh, serious uh, effects of, of that. But um, but you know, it's had an impact there. I think it certainly seems to have accelerated a lot of trends. Um, we're now spending all our time on, on screens. Um, we're on a screen right now. Um, I think that, and I think that's, uh, we're, it's simultaneously accelerating some of these. And then we're also learning, like, maybe we don't want, uh, to live all our lives on screens or in a digital world. And I've, I've heard that reaction from some people to NFTs now is like, now is sort of the worst time for them to feel like, um, we want to just like upload everything. And now look like, why would you, why would you go anywhere else? All your possessions and uh, all your, uh, your entire life has now been uploaded. And so you can just look at the screen all day. And I think we're starting to realize that in some aspects that that could be more dystopian than maybe we had, we had anticipated before we tried it. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really funny observation, Dan. Um, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, to, to, I think that, um, right, we're spending, right, internet culture is eating culture because we're spending so much more time on the internet. Crypto is a form of, of of one of the leading edges of internet culture. Um, so it makes sense for that to get accelerated in, in kind of terms of exposure and adoption. Um, and, you know, like, like most things, most things digital, crypto was a benefactor of just the increased screen time and the increased reliance on, on the internet. Switching gears just a little bit. Um, so, so we've talked about some exciting trends in the crypto space, but what are some of the main challenges that you think crypto founders and early stage crypto companies are facing today? And how, if at all, have those changed in the last few years? I think that the, the, sorry, I'll let go ahead. Oh, I, um, I, I, yeah, sorry, go for it. 
I, I would say the biggest, and perhaps this is just me using my lawyer lens, but I, I'd say that the, the, the biggest challenge still remains regulation. I think it, it's pretty clear that what this technology is enabling is demanded by users, by consumers. Um, I think what's standing in the way is um, just a, 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 an overall ambiguity in the regulatory standing of the assets, in some cases of the transaction models, in some cases. Um, and I think it's, it, it's unfortunate, I think in, in at least some of our companies that are based in the US feel that they are a little bit hamstrung relative to competitors overseas. Um, and, you know, I think we've been talking about getting regulatory clarity for, for years now. I think in some cases it's happened. I think in some cases it's been market driven in the sense that I think the, the kind of increasing mainstreamization of Bitcoin, for example, as a accepted financial asset will only continue to help and will convince regulators that this isn't just the province of money launderers and criminals, but actually is being kind of accepted and used by Fortune 500 companies, by mainstream investors, et cetera. But there are other areas where we still lack clarity as to the status of these things. And um, you know, well-intentioned companies and founders feel like they are kind of fishing in the dark when they are building their products. I think that would, that would be one of the biggest things for me. Yeah, I, I think I think that that Jeff's point is really good. In in addition, I would say um, I I think we have um, we need more talented people to get into crypto. Um, I think right now we've done a terrific job of home growing talent within crypto, um, people that kind of find it on their own, maybe without a conventional um, background um, that you'd see in, in kind of other uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs to have. But um, I think the endogenous crypto talent is, is amazing and, and, and we've done a terrific job of it, but there's an opportunity to connect it to broader pockets of talent that we have in Silicon Valley and, and other places where we have a lot of great expertise to tap into. And I think um, it's hard right now because uh, a lot of the, your instincts need to be rewired and, 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 and just spending time in the space, understanding the names, the characters, the personalities, how things fit together. Um, it just takes time. Um, but, but I think that we have really unbelievable, talented people, um, right? You're talented engineers, talented product people, um, talented designers, everybody. Um, and, and we need to find a, a, a way to, to help bring them in um, and do so effectively. <laughs> Dan, before I let you jump in, just to follow on to both of those questions, we have a lot of law students uh, and sort of potential lawyers on this call right now. And so speaking of, of talent and where people should go, where do you think people should be trying to go to make the most impact in terms of sort of solving some of these roadblocks? You want to take that, Dan? I think, uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of opportunity right now in um, crypto startups for, for law students interested in, in um, crypto like a lot of them need need legal help um, in more ways than one. And I think the, uh, like a, a lot of them, I know, I know Uniswap um, has uh, talked to, to uh, HLS uh, BFI about, about um, internships. And I think like uh, we've been working with, with some, um, uh, some law school associations, I think inclu including, including you uh, on sort of helping out with Uniswap governance. And so I think there's ways to do that well in law school um, as well. Uh, the only thing I would add is that um, at, at a kind of more general level, there are very few industries, and at present talking to the law students now, there are very few other industries that have, that you could have the potential to have so much like outsized impact as you do in this industry. Um, and, and I'm speaking from, from experience as someone who is kind of on the traditional kind of Wall Street track. Um, the, the type of work you'll be doing in that space is just, um, while it can be interesting and very rewarding, I think it is the law in those cases is oftentimes pretty much settled for the most part. And so you don't really get the, the chance that you do in this industry to use your critical thinking skills to reason up from the ground and try to make arguments as to why the types of things we're doing in this space don't really implicate the same risks as the kind of prior paradigm, for example. And so you get to really be on the ground floor of a, a growing industry that really requires good lawyers and critical thinking. Yeah, and, 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 and the good news right now um, is that there are a lot of startups that are flush with capital that have product market fit um, and have real um, problems to solve and, and kind of operational objectives to achieve. Um, and I think if we contrast today's era to the era a couple of years ago, um, most 
startups, even well-capitalized ones, were still in, in kind of very much ideation or kind of um, their first design phases. Um, whereas now there are concrete problems to solve. There are integrations to get done. There are business development relations to put into place. Um, there are, um, right, it, it looks much more like what we're used to um, for, for kind of people joining rapidly scaling startups. Um, and so that, that's an opportunity for folks that are multi, multidisciplinary in nature, more of an opportunity for non-technical people to get involved. Um, and so I would, I'd say it causes for a big time revisitation of priors if you've kind of explored it earlier and, and kind of now to reassess. So I wanna um, open it up to questions from the audience in just a moment. So if people have questions, please drop them into the Q and A. Um, but sort of my last question before we do is, you know, the name of this panel um, is, well, we've changed the name a few times, but we're talking about institutional investment here. And so you've all been involved in this ecosystem for quite a while. Um, so how, if at all, do you think the increase in institutional capital over the last few years has changed the crypto ecosystem? And do you expect any like other big changes in the future? Um, from, from my perspective, um, I, I would say two major um, influences of, of the inflow of institutional capital. Um, in terms of, of, of kind of the assets or, or kind of crypto directly, I would say Bitcoin has been the biggest primary benefactor of institutional capital. That's the asset right now that some of the early adopting institutions are willing to take directly. Um, it's still pretty early in its institutional adoption phase. Um, but, but in terms of a specific crypto asset, it, it's really a story about Bitcoin. Um, and then I would say um, funds um, and kind of crypto dedicated um, investment strategies um, has been the other kind of primary vector for institutional capital to enter um, or as LPs in, in funds like ours. Um, and so that, that to me has been the, the two strongest um, kind of outputs of that. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. so far the main, yeah, the main impact yeah. has definitely been on um, in Bitcoin, and that's certainly what uh, the institutional capital is, is, has been. Um, I think it's, it's a seismic shift has been able to really wrap their head around since since the last cycle. Um, I do think right now, uh, uh, certainly firms like ours play a big role in trying to translate um, some of the some of the new concepts that are coming to um, to, to institutional investors. But I think. Uh, Right now, again, like it's very early in terms of in terms of anyone outside of this uh, bubble having really any visibility into um, or, or or caring that much about sort of the details that are happening. And I think that's part of the advantage that crypto has right now is that it's kind of happening within this bubble. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. That you know, while at least on the Bitcoin side, there's been massive inflows amongst institutional investors who kind of have more of a, a macro orientation to think about the asset as kind of the digital gold story or from corporates who are kind of thinking in the same way. I, I would say within the, the venture space, we're still very, very early. I think in a lot of ways, the industry hasn't really crossed over to a lot of mainstream venture investors still. I think a lot of them will kind of, you know, peek their head in during the bull times, but then will leave sometimes during the, the crypto winters. Amongst the kind of, you know, uh, pure crypto investors who stick around, I think it's still pretty early. So. Uh, a lot of lot of opportunity out there for sure. Great. Um, so let's take our first question from Chris out in the audience, um, and he wants to know what your thoughts are on NFTs such as Lava Coin, the world's first marijuana NFT. Uh, seems to me that owning a virtual trading card, uh, NBA Top Shot, for example, has value, but are there far too many NFTs with no real value? How do you think about these issues? I'll just offer. Ways the, the, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I think you know, like any other new kind of boom, there will be certainly excesses that, that pop up, um, and so I think you know we will almost certainly see a um, you know kind of a, a tapering off or kind of a, a, a retreat a little bit in in the current NFT enthusiasm. Um, that said, you know if you think about NFTs as being um, you know, representations of art or media or other things that have Kind of cultural affinities. Um, it, it's hard to kind of say which and which of those should not have value to certain people, right? Like if you think about the way people think about art or value it, um, it's very subjective. And this is a way for people to be able to put a specific price on a digital good like that. So um, 
it, it's hard to say which will and, and will not succeed in this space. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing that was surprising to me um, in the NFT world is um, I, didn't, I didn't know how ready we were for mainstream IP to play a role here. Um, I think NBA Top Shot was a really um, interesting data point um, that, that made me, frankly, it made me realize that I was wrong in, in kind of underestimating um, the viability of some of these things. I was under the impression that NFTs would be more about crypto culture and kind of bottoms up internet culture finding its way um, through its progressive early adopter phases into the mainstream. And I didn't think that we could put things like the NBA or, or kind of Harry Potter, Disney, stuff like that on chain. Um, and it would really strike a chord. Um, but, but that to me has caused a, a big reevaluation of, of how I thought about that, that kind of adoption. And, and now it feels like there's really both a top down mass market IP model, as well as this kind of bottoms up kind of crypto or internet oriented um, motion for these things too. I think I'm still trying to wrap my head around the NFT phenomenon as, as it's happening. And my view has been from the, from the bottom up and I'm starting to see as well the, uh, the pattern coming from the top down. I and mean, one fascinating thing about NFTs from a regulatory perspective is that they pretty obviously have no value. And so actually they get around basically any worries that someone might have that, that these might, might be securities, for example. And what we're seeing is that actually maybe all along people weren't buying these tokens with the expectation of profits or at, least, or at least with the expectation of sort of anything in particular being done. People sort of just like to buy stuff. People like to collect things. And so when influencers were, were selling tokens, and people were buying them, you know, the, uh, it sort of, it looks kind of shady, but like then when they, when they start selling NFTs, you see like, oh, sort of people just want to buy this because, because of the, uh, of the influencer. And so I think we're starting to see it's a controlled experiment for the, for say the, the 2017 boom, which is just, what if we did this, but with no pretense at all of, of, va of value other than just the fact of the, of the token's existence. And I think it's been a fascinating, um, at least so far, a positive result in that. Yeah, I, I think I think the cynical view would be that these are just money making opportunities. People are just going to flip them. They see a secondary market. I think perhaps the, the longer term view is that these are ways to connect with a creator, with an artist, or whatever it might be, and to develop an affinity with. with let's say you're a new artist who's putting a song out, or a you know an artist who's putting a painting out to really directly connect with your users. Um, and your use, from your user's perspective, it's a way to demonstrate that you are a super fan or that you have some sort of status within the ecosystem. And so you could really imagine a kind of community uh, thing developing around these, these tokens. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I think we all probably agree that there's there's a bubbly character to it, but at the same time, there's, there's probably something that'll have a lasting impact that, that's here as well. Um, I, I think it's funny to kind of compare and contrast a lot of the arguments against NFTs to a lot of, they have the same shape as the arguments against Bitcoin um, that were being voiced earlier, where, right, it's like, isn't this all speculation, value from nothing, um, right, isn't, isn't scarcity an illusion, can't I just fork it or can't I just copy the NFT, um, and so the arguments are, are kind of, uh, are a mirror um, in some sense, and, and again, we're going to come up with good answers and solutions to those, and a lot of it is just, um, you know, people not understanding um, what others uh, believe in or kind of derive value from. Um, but but I, I just thought that was a pretty funny observation. I yeah, it, 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 oh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, I was just gonna say it really is the same concept of digital scarcity, where, where with Bitcoin, it was around money here, it's with anything else potentially. And so you could easily see um, the appeal going both ways. Great. So I think that actually segues us into our next set of questions. So we have two questions about risks posed from new currencies. Uh, so from Lewis, how does the panel think about the upside of investing in blockchain specific applications versus the potential risk of new currencies and blockchains to emerge? And then relatedly, we have a question um, asking whether the threat of new currencies adds a confounding variable into the potential scarcity offered by a specific currency. It's, I'll, I'll take a stab. I, I think in many ways, the best and worst thing that, 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 that happened in this space is the use of the word currency. Um, in, the, in the sense that it, it kind of brought all of these really important um, concepts to the forefront and it ignited a controversy and it got people thinking deeply about the role of money in society. I think it was critical. 
Um, but now I think it actually um, can obscure what's actually happening. And I think if you kind of just think of these things as, as kind of currency based on a preconception of a currency that you may have um, as somebody, for example, in the US, then I think you're missing what's special about a lot of what's occurring here. Um, right. I, 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 again, I always try to reframe these things as rather than currencies, these things are like startups or these things are like applications, some of which have monetary use cases, um, others don't. Um, but but right, think of them as, as not all coins are created equal. Not all coins have the same types of business model. Um, and, and it's pretty critical to take a more granular understanding of it um, in order to, to have the right view. Um, so that, that's kind of the spiel about just thinking about these things as kind of currencies competing with one another. Um, and I think there's, there's a separate question of how, does, how do crypto monetary assets impact, um, impact money worldwide? Um, and, and I think that um, that's, a, that's a meteor topic and it relates to regulation. It relates to a lot that will play out um, over the next several decades, um, how central banks um, embrace um, digital currencies as a part of what they do, whether they accept it or reject it. Um, um, it it's certainly going to be really important on, on, on that stage, but, but how it plays out, it, it's above my pay grade. Maybe, maybe Dan or Jeff uh, have a better idea. Yeah, so I think to the specific question of whether new currencies threaten older ones, um, my colleague Matt Huang uh, wrote, a, wrote a post called Bitcoin for the Open-Minded Skeptic, which is usually the first thing that I send to, um, to sort of outsiders looking at Bitcoin and asking these kind of questions. And the, one of the arguments there is that the existence of the ability to create new currencies all the time um, actually makes the first one uh, more special. And that's one of the, the, the fact that Bitcoin was first, the fact that it has this almost uh, mythical origin story, um, the fact that it's been around the longest, every year that adds to um, essentially the shelling point around it as what people will consider as like, this is, this is the digital asset worth taking seriously. And I think we've started to see um, theses like that play out. Where, and this is, this is happening on Ethereum um, possibly as well, where if there was one project that was trying to kill, um, or kill Ethereum, that was trying to, to basically be a new smart contract platform, Ethereum right now is where a lot of the activity is happening. Um, if there was one platform trying to supplant it, then it might be able to out-execute it. But if you have 100 platforms trying to out-execute it, then they end up maybe killing each other in the circular firing squad rather than, rather than uh, killing the incumbent. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is um, I think unlike in 2017 when everything was mostly designed around this idea of being a currency or being a kind of utility token that you had to use as a medium of exchange, we, we've moved in the more recent uh, wave towards tokens encompassing other types of rights or, or features. Uh, this obviously ties into the governance discussion we had earlier with a lot of these tokens that imbue the holder with the right to decide on you know, certain features within the protocol. You might even imagine that at some point down the line, in some of those cases, they might represent uh, the ability to earn cash flows that are earned by the protocol. Um, they might kind of allow you to decide on adding new features. And so I think one positive uh, kind of high level shift from the prior design uh, kind of paradigm of tokens has been increasingly adding these new kind of valuable rights and, and features to them. So we're almost out of time here. So I, I'll just ask one final question. Um, and that is in one or two sentence, if you could give a piece of advice to someone who's looking to, to an early stage crypto founder right now, what is sort of one thing you would tell them? Uh, Dan, do you wanna start? I would tell them, I would say build something that you individually are passionate about. And I think that's what we've, when we've seen the most successful founders, that's something that they've done. And the more people think that that's a stupid idea, probably the more promising it is. Oh, um, next? oh, Jeff, go ahead. Um, let's see. Uh, one, one would be hire good lawyers. Um, and the other, I, I guess, you know, it, it can be, oh, this is, this is, this is going to be more than, than two sentences, but the, this industry has tended to, to move in, in cycles and in waves. Um, and it can be very um, kind of compelling and there's a lot of sunlight during the, the bull times, but during the, the winters, it is incredibly difficult and can be very hard to kind of stick with it. So uh, 
uh, I think taking a longer view um, is, is helpful sometimes. Yeah, I, I would say to, um, to entrepreneurs, um, there are a lot of seductive ideas in crypto, a lot of big picture visions for where things are headed. Um, but um, don't forget that solving concrete problems, um, making incremental progress, um, right? There are problems to solve. Um, there are much more concrete and tangible objectives that you need to think about. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I, I would say um, go to market matters, product matters, the basics of, of startups still matter in crypto. Um, and I think that there's a tendency to fall in love with the ideas at the expense of just what it means to find product market fit um, and, and make users happy. Um, and so I would say always a reminder to kind of focus on those things. It's still really important. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to end. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who's joined us today. And in particular, thank you so much to our panelists for making time to be with us. Uh, we have our next panel, Censorship Resistant Bitcoin as a sponsor of Social Change, starting in about 10 minutes. And we hope many of you are able to join us there. Thank